talking about a rainfall that's two inches a minute. It's a rainfall you've never seen and can't even imagine. You'd walk out and splat. You'd be on the ground from that amount of water falling down. Matters get only worse. I didn't know before uh, preparing for this uh, debate, or whatever it is, that uh, when it rains, heat is released. Uh, and someone sat down and done the calculation. Well, if you have this monstrous level of rain occurring, you have an enormous release of heat. And the calculation is that the resulting water is roughly between two and 6,000 degrees. A boiling cauldron of water produced by this vision of Noah's flood. Killing off marine fish, freshwater fish, all kinds of vegetation beneath and so on. And yet somehow magically 6,000 years ago, the water all managed to evaporate back down to our placid level of existence uh, right now. Now there are big absurdities and there are small ones. A small absurdity has to do with fossil footprints. I've seen hominid fossil footprints in Olduvai Gorge dated to three uh, million years ago look human, but they're smaller. I've seen dinosaur footprints. I've seen bird footprints. How on earth are all these creatures able to leave footprints with this mass of rain coming down, scouring uh, whole uh, um, hills down to nothing, but magically leaving uh, fossil footprints? Um, then you've got... Uh, uh, other problems. The fossil records show that recent creatures uh, in the fossil record just below the top are located where the current ones are. So you find marsupial fossils in Australia. Now how do you assemble these creatures? Noah sends word, I need two lions from the Serengeti, male and female. I need two uh, kangaroos from Australia. And don't exhaust yourself on the trip here, by the way, because you've got a hell of a trip back. You're going to be walking on mud hundreds of feet deep just to get back to where you belong. And matters are worse still. Uh, what about disease? Um, almost all human diseases have to live inside humans. There are some, like malaria, that have a mosquito intermediate host, but the rest go just human to human. So those 10 humans uh, on Noah's Ark have got to have between them all the human diseases. Of course, if you've got a creative mind and unconstrained by reality, you can invent an ad hoc hypothesis for that. Ah, the diseases came from other creatures, but they left no uh, remnants back in those other creatures. Our diseases do not resemble closely the diseases of other creatures. And the same argument that applies to us applies to every one of the other species on the ark, too. In other words, when they call for two lions from the Serengeti, they say, be sure one of you is bringing half of all lion diseases and the other is bringing the other half. Sick unto death they have to be to maintain biological diversity of diseases. So to summarize, we, we're being asked to replace a coherent, logical story based on millions of pieces of evidence, carefully analyzed and organized, and, and are offered instead a fanciful tale with a dreadful view of God's world, a cataclysmic world, a disaster of, of unimaginable proportions, which nevertheless had the magical power to splat, produce a fossil record that imitated what you'd expect if evolution took place. I thank you. All right, well thank you. It is an honor to be here and I appreciate Dr. Trivers coming. It is extremely difficult to find professors willing to defend the evolution theory. Uh, I've been turned down over 3,000 times. Uh, this has just had a few debates. I'm just a simple high school science teacher that is sick and tired of the kids being lied to in their textbooks. So we'll cover all the points that he made as time permits here. If I forget what, bring it up during the question answer session. Okay, let's see. Oh. Let me present the creation viewpoint uh, clearly and succinctly. So uh, people say, you don't have a, you guys don't have a model that you offer. Yes, we do. It's very simple. God created everything about 6,000 years ago. 
in six literal 24-hour days. This is the only possible way that I can see to explain what are called symbiosis relationships where thousands of animals require certain plants or certain plants require certain animals. For instance, in the termite's gut, there's a little critter that lives in there that cannot live outside the termite. The ter termite cannot live without that little critter in there. Which one evolved first? And how did it live for millions of years without the other one? That is only one of literally billions of examples that can be found in nature that are best explained by a simultaneous creation just in a few short days. Then I believe there was a worldwide flood about 4,400 years ago that completely destroyed this planet. I think that's the only logical way to explain the fossils. There's a ph phenomenon that takes place during uh, floods called a cavitation and another one called a liquefaction. We can get into a bit more of that later. Um, uh, if you shake up a jar of dirt with water in it, it'll automatically settle into layers for you. And it's interesting, during a liquefaction, when, uh, if you go out to the beach, like I live in Florida, six miles from the beach, if you go stand knee deep in the water, as the waves come by, the high part of the wave is lower, is, is uh, higher and heavier than the low part of the wave. This presses down on the sand, and then when the low part comes by, it relieves the pressure. And if you go underwater with goggles, you can actually see the sand grains hopping up off the bottom. And particles are automatically sorted based upon their density just by the pressure of the waves coming past. During Noah's flood, you'd get a liquefaction problem. That would be incredible because you'd have no, no continents to restrict the tides. And the tides would be probably a 200-foot tidal change during Noah's flood, explaining the sorting of the fossil record. Reptiles are found in a similar layer because reptiles have similar body density. There's a lot of reasons. We'll get into more of that later. So the Bible view teaches that before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. There are thousands of legends from around the world of cu cultures talking about what they called the Golden Age, when people used to live to be a thousand. I mean, the Greeks talked about it, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, and the Bible certainly says Adam was 930 when he died, and everybody before the flood lived over 900 years. Reptiles never stop growing, and as, as well as squids and most octopus and stuff like that, they simply never stop growing. So I believe before the flood came, the reptiles grew to be huge, and dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, just giant lizards. And then Noah took them on the ark, probably babies. He was smart enough to figure out, just bring two babies. Be sure to get a pink one and a blue one, though. And so that's the Bible view, that dinosaurs uh, were called dragons through most of history, since the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. And people throughout the last 6,000 years have killed nearly all of them. There may be a few stragglers still around. There's certainly been an awful lot of sightings of various creatures, and that's the study of cryptozoology. There's a couple pictures of ones that washed up on the beach in California in 1925 on my website, if you care to go there. So science means knowledge, to know. It is systemized knowledge derived from observation and study. There is no observation that tells us a dog ever came from a non-dog. Now, if you'd like to believe that, that's perfectly fine, but that is not science. Evolution, whatever it is, is not science. It is a religious worldview that people choose to believe in, and that's perfectly fine. You can believe whatever you want. But I, for one, am sick and tired of them taking our tax dollars to teach this religion in our school system. That's my take on it. I am, I'm certainly not against science. I like science. I like it very much, as a matter of fact. We have a science center, a hands-on activity center. We have a museum. We have all kinds of activities for kids. We actually like science. I don't know any Christians that don't like science. There may be some, but I don't know them. I like science, but I'm sick of the kids getting lied to. Now, Texas has a law that requires the textbooks to be accurate. So does Florida. So does Wisconsin. So does Alabama. So does California. Most states require textbooks to be accurate. All I want is accuracy in the textbooks. All of the evidence that's used to support the evolution theory has been proven fraudulent, and I'll take any bit of evidence you want. We'll show you which one it is. They use all sorts of, about 50 different things. They don't have time in 15 minutes, obviously. But this fellow says, evolution is a fact. This is called a mantra. You say it over and over and over, and pretty soon you start believing it. He says, the evidence for evolution comes from the fossil record. The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. I would like to point out, if evolution were on trial in a court of law, absolutely no fossils would count because you can't prove those bones had any kids. You sure can't prove they had different kids. And why on earth would you